All right, now joining us on Tennis Channel Inside and back again, becoming a little bit of a regular on these parts, uh, but calling in on location, uh, producing tennis for the Olympic Games, which start in just a few days. Brett Connors, TC producer, host of the Advantage Connors podcast with his father, the Hall of Fame tennis player, Jimmy Connors. But Brett, it's time to talk the Olympics. Excited to do that with you here. Money, how are you? Thanks for having me. Talking to you from a Stanford, Connecticut hotel room. Living it up on the East Coast, but uh, yeah, we're a few days away, ready to talk some tennis. Yeah, this is another uh, Olympic Games you get to cover. I know you went to Florida during 2021, the weird, uh, I'll call it weird, Tokyo Olympics with that setup, a year delayed, but producing tennis remotely, getting ready for an interesting, a unique time in the tennis calendar. There's not that many one-week events that are, you know, this big or this prestigious, but we're gearing up for what could be a transcendent Olympic game. How has it been adjusting to prepping for a week such as this? Uh, it's been good. You know, it's a, a little different coming off regular tour, tour life to then all of a sudden Olympics. You know, uh, I did three years ago for Tokyo. That was fun. Zverev and uh, Bencic took home the golds for the, for the singles. Um, this time it seems like it's very transitional. You know, it seems like we might see a couple of the greats last matches um and then we have you know the new guys like center and alcaraz alcaraz seems unstoppable right now the way he's played this summer so uh i know we might get into the odds later but it's you know tough to bet against him but it seems like it's uh you know like in the rest of tennis it's transitioning to a new time you know a lot of the people we've been used to the last 15 or 20 years are have ended you know they've retired or they're coming to the end and you know now the new guys are going to take up the mantle and, and carry it forward yeah this issue with the olympics and i don't even call it an issue but we always talk about fan part or player participation and who actually plays who decides to play talked about it on last week's show there's a lot of factors that go in i don't begrudge anyone that prioritizes something else or might be injured because you have to make money and you have to earn a living on the tour but it definitely means a lot and it means a lot clearly to the players that are making this sacrifice to participate in the olympics for a tennis player I know they have other things and other athletes, Brett, they gear up for the Olympics. It's their end-all, be-all. But for players that come here, there's obviously pride in yourself and your country. And it's different to be playing for something other than yourself in tennis. So I think that's the point I want to make is this is one of the few, maybe the only time for a lot of these players that they're playing for something bigger than their self and their ranking and their money. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to look at who puts this in a higher you know, pedestal than others. Some players, you say, are taking it off because they didn't want to go back to the clay and they want to get ready for the hardcore season like Sabi. But then other players like you know, Djokovic, who this is the one thing that's missing from his, his trophy chest is, is an Olympic gold medal. You know, Rafa's got his singles and he's got a doubles. Um, you know, playing with Carlos, you know, just the, the, the feeling you get when you're playing for your country seems like it's still different than Davis Cup. Davis Cup has that feeling, but it's more, you know, team here. It's, you know, you're individual, you're going for the gold medal alone. And then, you know, if you're playing doubles, whatever. But um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to see, you know, I know Zverev said he would have rather won his gold than won a Grand Slam. I don't know if I really believe that to this day, but, uh, you know, I think some people put it higher up than others. Yeah, and uh, should also point out, too, that transition back to clay can be brutal. Uh, grass, to, clay to grass, they're used to. It's a little lighter on the joints, as you know, but going back to clay from grass, not a transition that's ever made and also can be very, very brutal. Uh, first time, Brett, since 92 Barcelona Olympics, we're going to have clay court tennis yeah. at the Olympics. So Reset and Jennifer Capriati win gold. I know Jennifer Capriati. I, I don't have to say your, her name too much for your eyes to light right up. Right. And Rosé, I mean, talk about not a clay quarter. I mean, he was a big, big yeah. server, huge serve, tall guy. The fact that he won on clay is surprising. But I mean, over the years, it's fun to to look back and see the players who have won, and some are you know surprising, and and others are expected. Um, and so you know, like Djokovic going out to Delpo in 2016, you know, in the first round, like what a tough draw to pull him. Um, so it's, it's, it's a different beast, you know, like it's two out of three, it's not three out of five. So in that way, you think maybe it's a little more open for some upsets. Um, if someone can come out hot and, and get on the board with the first set, but yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So I'll start with this. Cause we got a lot of ground to cover a lot of ways to attack this and break down the Olympics here on tennis channel inside in, but what's your favorite storyline? What are you looking forward to the most? Heading into the Olympics, it's subject to change and there's a lot to pick from, but what's the storyline that most excites you? I mean, I think early it's got to be like the storylines like Murray 
uh, Nadal, just because this, this is definitely going to be Murray's last tournament. He said he's come out and said it. Nadal might be. We don't know. He's entered the U.S. Open, but we don't know if that's just because they gave him the deadline and he had to make the decision if he's really going to do it. But I think early it's those guys because – and then once you get past these first couple rounds, they and they might bow out. Then we start to get into the like Carlos, you know, Carlos and Nadal playing doubles is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. That's going to be uh, entertaining. Um, you know how Sinner looks coming back. How's Iga going to do? It's going to be tough to beat Iga on the clay, yeah. uh, especially in Roller Garros where she's got four titles already. Um, so yeah, I just think it's the old dudes early, and then it's the young dudes later. Yeah, that's a good point. And Andy Murray, uh, who's the only one of anyone on this list that's officially said this is it. We think it will be, and presumably it will be everyone's last Olympics because it's going to come around four more years from now for the older players. But Murray will be retiring after this tournament, competing for Great Britain. Won two gold medals back-to-back, 12 and 16, and defending a gold medal was pretty remarkable. He's a very passionate guy. We know that he's accomplished so much in his career. Yet it's pretty cool for his sake that the lasting image was going to be representing his country. It's going to be what he's most known for, especially since, Brett, he's from a country that he ended a long drought for. You know, 76, 77 years before anyone won a gold medal or a Wimbledon title, or a major, I should say, in a Wimbledon title, and uh, winning two gold medals. He's going to be known for national pride and just competing his tail off. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, winning two gold medals also got that silver with mixed doubles with uh, Laura Robson back in the day. Don't forget about that money. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fitting in a way because early on, you know, it was the whole, is he Scottish? Is he British? And then, you know, do they accept them? And then all the burden he carried always felt like it was a little bit more than the other, you know, big four were like, they weren't competing against this history or this, this name, you know, Fred Perry and, and uh, you know, it's been this long and when are we going to get another winner? Blah, blah, blah. So to see him, you know, be able to perform the way he did and win everything that he's done in his career, I think this is a good way for him to go out representing the country. And, you know, he's had so much success in it before. It's, you know, should be fun. You never have to doubt Rafael Nadal's patriotism. You see him competing in Davis Cup ties. You see him coming back from injuries to get out there. We don't know if this is going to be the end for him. We do know that he's going to leave it all out there, which he always does. Singles will be a tall task given all the tennis he just played in Gestad and given where his body's at. But the double side of it is huge. We'll get to that a little later. He's playing with Carlos Alcaraz, who you know, grew up idolizing him, gets to play with the legend. And they're going to be a live team. Nadal won that gold medal in Rio with Marco Lopez. He's a pretty underrated doubles player in a lot of regards. There's going to be some pressure there. And I think, it, weirdly enough, Brett might be Alcaraz that feels it. Like, how can I make sure I send off this legend properly? Right. Yeah, and it's like, you know, Rafa's one of the best doubles players in the world. You know, he's like, over his career, he just got better and better and better to where he's got some of the best hands at net. And, you know, he knows the game so well, his IQ is so high. But you're right, uh, Carlos is probably looking at it like, you know, I want I want to win this, you know, but I'm the younger guy. I don't want to mess it up. But I think that's going to be a fun team, man. I think that's, you know, I think yeah. they're going to have some success. If I was one of the top doubles teams or whoever's got the top rankings, we'll look at that in a minute. They're not going to want to see yeah. them on the other side because they know they're in for a long day. Yeah, I don't want to begrudge doubles specific players, but in the Olympics, some of the best doubles matches I've ever seen personally has been when you get singles versus doubles or a lot of a combination like Fed Stan versus the Bryans right. in the Olympics was one of the best doubles matches ever. So you get a renewed focus and you get these singles players committing because at the end of the day, it's about winning a gold medal, winning for your country and having that. And uh, whether it's in doubles or singles, I'll put it this way. Nadal doesn't probably look at his doubles gold medal any less than the singles one. No, you know, he might even look at it more just because he won it with somebody else. You know, what about yeah. Fed and Stan? I can't remember what year that was, but they won. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that was, a, that was a great celebration where, you know, Stan's on the ground and Fed's doing the, the thing over <laughs> him. Um, so, yeah, man, I think it's, it's a, a way to come together and have some camaraderie. You know, you're usually playing against all these guys individually. So, even though it's still a normal tournament, you know, you still have your country's teams and you're doing all the events together and posing for the pictures and eating together. So that's all fun. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool too. The fact that they, Hey, I'm going to play doubles. Hey, I'm going to play mixed doubles too. You know, like, why not? We're already here. And then, you know, it's just another chance to get another medal. Uh, was it Pavley and Rublev last time? Right. Wasn't yeah. that the, t- the, right. the one? Yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. fun team. 
It was a fun team. <laughs> uh, and looking at it too, I mean, there's just nothing as we get into like Djokovic and some of the bigger storylines, there's nothing like hearing your anthem if you win, looking into the crowd, seeing everyone from your country cheering the colors. It really does bring out the best. And I, I say that as we segue into Novak Djokovic because there's been no more transparent athlete in regard to the Olympics than him recently. This is the one event that he's never won. He's looking to complete an already complete trophy case by adding a gold medal. It's going to be a tall task given what Alcaraz and Sinner have done for the game, but yet you see when he's out here just how much it means to him. Brett, you referenced that Del Potro match where he lost first round. Easily, to me, the most emotion he's ever shown. He left the court crying. He was devastated. He didn't react like that losing in major finals. This means a lot to him, and I think you know the pressure is going to be something interesting. How does he come out knowing that this might be, could be the last chance he has to get that elusive gold medal? Yeah, I think, you know, the way he's, I mean, at this point, he's got to find things to motivate him. I mean, he's the leader in the clubhouse with Grand Slams. You know, he's almost got 100 titles. You know, he's got every record pretty much in the book. So there's a few things that keep him going. They're pretty much are more slams and the Olympics, you know, is what I think. So he's probably been targeting this for the last three years since he lost to, uh, was Carreno Busta, right, in the, in the, in the bronze medal match. So... Yeah. You know, I think this is what is it's a bummer. He had to have the knee scoped and the meniscus. You know, we looked good at Wimbledon until he ran into Carlos, and Carlos is kind of just a different animal right now. But yeah, uh, yeah you never know. Like somebody, if upset, you know, Carlos gets upset or something happens in the draw, it might open up for Joker. And and like I wouldn't want to play him. You know, he's going to be focused on this more than probably anything else in the to in the year, to be honest. You know. Yeah. Um, you're right. He cried leaving the court against Delpo. I'm a big Delpo guy. I love Delpo. That match was great. Um, and it mm. seems like he's got one spare spot in his trophy cabinet and it's, it's for this, it's for a gold medal, silver, you know, he'll celebrate it and he'll be happy, but he wants the gold. He does. And nobody really, if anybody likes their country as much as him, it's tough to see because he just loves being Serbian. He loves that national pride. He's very proud of his heritage and, representing the country like Nadal will always play the ties and be there. I think the pressure side might rear its head early, but I think when he gets into the zone and he gets some wins under his belt and the draw starts to be more realistic to getting to the finish line, I think he'll actually be at ease knowing that he's as good as he is. And also Brett, there is no worry about the knee. You know, we saw that. I know we ran into Alcaraz who was a different level, but it's funny. We were looking at this saying, Oh, I wonder how healthy he's going to be. Those health questions to me at least aren't really serious. Yeah, I think you're right. Like we were talking about it earlier this week. Like, is the clay better or worse for him with the knee? And I think it's better because like the mm -hmm. points might be longer, but there's, you're not worried about like, how many times did you see watching Wimbledon or the grass court season where the guys would go to split step and both their legs would like split out from under them? Like that's a scary. Yeah, Grigor cost him the tournament. Right. Grigor cost him the tournament getting injured on that. Yeah. It, that's a good point. And, and I, I actually think, I mean, it's the bigger question right now Kras too like we'll get into him and center in a second but whether you're Novak Djokovic or Alcaraz center or a player further down if you if you have expectations to win and do well and you're one top player this is a different beast it doesn't happen a lot this is your only chance for four years there's that fine line of having anxiety but also that laser sharp focus so if you manage that if you can come in locked in playing your game knowing and trusting your game and no one knows their body and their game more than Novak Djokovic you can overcome that anxiety and it can actually be a gift in helping you focus more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think he's going to be able to focus. I'm interested in the two out of three because with, mm. with Joker, you're always like, look, it's different animal, three out of five beating him. <clears throat> but I'm wondering like, you know, with anybody, with any of the guys there, you know, we could get one versus two or we could get some upsets. It feels like because somebody could come out and if you're hot and you take the first set, then you're pretty much a yeah. coin flip at least to try and come out on the other side of the match. So I think that element makes it a little different, but uh, I mean, those top three or four guys, it's, it's tough, man. It's, they're all playing really good tennis and, and, you know, sets up for some good matchups later. Yeah, you don't have that set to kind of just give away early. You lose a set and then one more, you're going home. Right. So you, you do have to be locked in super early. You know, Alcaraz and center, I mean, Carlos has four majors. Now he's won three out of the last five and center being the world number one. You know, looking at these guys, Alcaraz in particular, Brett, he's expected to win. This was the Rafa spot in 08 where, you know, Fed was there too. Fed gets bounced early. Rafa wins his gold. Mm -hmm. But there's no guarantees, and there's no guarantees you ever get back here. So 
I know that he's riding high and he'll have more cracks at this, but it also feels like for his sake to alleviate the pressure, just get this one now and not worry about chasing this for the rest of your career. Right. And what, what an amazing year it sets up for, for him to, you know, he's already got two slams. He's, you know, he can do well at the U S open having won there already. Um, so yeah, like, and you never know the way life plays out. Injuries happen. Sicknesses happen. You don't know. I tweaked an ankle. It just happened to be the month before the Olympics. Uh, I got to wait four more years. So you never know. It might be eight years till the next one, just depending on how it all shakes out. So you got to take advantage of it when you can. And I think, you know, he knows that and, uh, like he's going to just keep doing what he's doing. Yeah. Before we go to the women, I did want to go over odds and what the men's look like. Again, the draw will be out probably by the time you hear this, we're recording this a few days before the draw gets released and then they start playing immediately on Saturday. So it'll be a jam packed, uh, thrill seeking couple of days here, but Alcaraz looking at about plus one thirty as the favorite. Then it's Djokovic plus two fifty range center buying him at plus 300. Uh, the number four seed in this tournament, the defending champion of the men's singles event, Alexander Zverev, plus 650. Then you'd have Nadal coming in, which getting that Nadal bump, but then it drops off Rude, Holger, Tsitsipas, Demon Hour, uh, and then thinning off to some Americans. But thoughts on the odds? Sinner, I guess, as a, as a point of contention, being number three, and then Zverev, the defending champion, number four. Yeah, it's... It's tough. I mean, until you see the draw, it's like it's difficult to say how it's all going to shake out. Yeah. But I mean, the two guys who feel like they have some value. I mean, I wish we could also get some odds to like to medal also along to place, right. you know, but like Rude is 12 to one. You know, he likes to play on clay. You know, he's a little, he, you know, disappears for the grass, but he does that every year. And then Sitsi, right. you know, you know, if he's going to do anything, it's going to be on clay probably. So, uh -huh. I mean, I think those two guys are kind of dangerous who might be, you know, they could upset somebody somewhere along the line in the draw. Yeah, Sitsipas is so uh, surface specific now that coming off of Wimbledon, you might think, oh, yeah. this isn't great. But yeah, he plays a lot better on the clay. We've seen it. I mean, he's 20 to yeah, one, somebody... like 20 to one to win yeah. the gold. But it's just like it's a big number to see a guy who, you know, has made the final mm -hmm. there and has won clay court masters before. Boy, Zverev that far off is a little shocking to me, not just because he won the gold, Brett, but because he made the French Open final. Like, he's obviously a good clay court player. So right. I think that number should be a little higher. Again, we'll see what the draw, and what if it side was, he's on. And if it was two out of three, he would have won, you know? So, like, the different, yeah. the different sets in, in a situation with someone like him might benefit him, so. Holger again, another one. I know it hasn't been great, but had a, had a decent showing uh, at RG and is looking to kind of bounce back in. Is he going to play? Um, so, I saw he had to pull out, like with a wrist this yeah, that's week. Another, so I don't know good if he... point. I think he's, I think he's going to try. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll have to see. But I would, you know, put there, put that point forward as well. And the Americans, if there's anyone you think could make a run, Fritz Paul, obviously being the top two. Yeah. Uh, could they make some noise in the men's single side? I mean, definitely, you know, I mean, they're both good on clay. I mean, uh, you know, I was surprised that uh, Paul won Queens, you know, like that's a, that's a pretty good win for him in a, in a good draw. I mean, I just think it depends on till we see how it all shakes out, who gets who early. Yeah. Is there any tough matches early because it's on clay? So it's hard to get quick, fast point wins. So you're going to have to earn everything. You know, every match wins going to be you know hard earned. We've seen some upsets and surprises and some interesting medalists, Fernando Gonzalez and <laughs> some of the women's names. So right. I don't know if Monica you can see Puig, the deep number. Monica Puig, 2016. Puig. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen a lot. Well, more more here with Brett Connors on Tennis Channel Inside In talking Olympic tennis, switching now to the women, the women's singles events loading up to be a great one too. Yeah, the last four gold medalists, just for those keeping score at home, were Belinda Bencic, Monica Puig, Serena and Dementavia. So we've got a lot of different champions there. That's right. Uh, looking, looking at it from the women's side, this being on clay, this being at Roland Garros, a lot of people will understandably think it's Iga's tournament to lose. Opens at a sizable minus 200 plus favor to win this <laughs> event. Staggering odds to say the least, especially since Brett, the only difference being she's not riding that high of just crushing the clay court events coming into this. Mm -hmm. She's coming off of that loss at Wimbledon. So maybe that's the only opening you could see because otherwise her game is just perfectly suited for these courts and this surface. Right. I mean, I feel like she probably lost at Wimbledon and went home and put her clay court shoes on and just that's all she's been thinking about since that, that day. 
Um, but I mean, it's tough. Like Coco, you see at five to one, it seems like a good number, but then you realize what is she like one and 11 or something like that against Iga. So if she doesn't have to play Iga, it's a good number. But then you like, you feel like she's going to run into Iga somewhere along the line. Um, you know, Osaka had, had chances to beat Iga at the French. If she doesn't, then Coco might win that tournament. It seems like the way everything shook <clears throat> out, but it didn't. And, you know, here we are. But, uh, I mean, minus 200, it's not, never fun to lay, especially on a future where someone has to win a whole tournament and you have to lay that number. But, I mean, if, if you had to take Eager of the field, what would you do? Probably Eager. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, I'm seeing like up to 250 now, so I don't know. I mean, but the smart money is most likely on Eager. No Sabalenka, so the seeds play out like this, Brett. It goes Rabak in a three with some okay value depending on her success plus 1100 mm -hmm. then it goes jasmine paulini the number four seed a remarkable <laughs> the french open finalist and then jesse pagula who didn't even play clay court season essentially so right. point being and i bring this up there's some sleepers we're probably going to see an unconventional bronze medalist and and given history but the field is there for ega you know her top contenders either aren't in form or aren't here outside of coco who that'd be the one i i almost wouldn't even like the field bet i'd just take coco as a, my my flyer as your you other know? one yeah how about this name the queen yelena ostapenko okay she knows she knows how to beat yep. Iga. if she can get in so she's on her the side. draw you know <laughs> yeah, you know you she go. likes to play in roland garros won there in 2017 clay court you know got a good game power game um Maybe just throwing that out there. She's like 25 or 30 to one. That could be a fun little flyer to root for. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw one too. Um, I, I wish, yeah, again, look at the options for making like a, make the metal stand right. or like a semi or something, depending on where you can find it. But Quinn Win Zhang, I think. Same odds as Ostapenko, about 29, 30 to one. Just won a title in Palermo. I think she's got the game. I think she's well-versed on clay and all surfaces. That could be one. She has taken a set off Iga at Roland Garros before, which is a huge accomplishment yeah. in this day and age. Yeah. So that'd be another one I would sprinkle on. What about Barbora? Fresh off Wimby. It's tough to, to follow up such a high, high, but you know, she can win. You know, she won there, what was it, 2021? And she has you know, a good record against it too. All surface yeah. player, has beaten all the best players. I mean, she's a little inconsistent, but she's playing some of the best tennis of her life. Yeah, I, I think that's another really smart one, too, because she's someone that will, she's so cerebral out there. Like, you watch her play, she's tactically locked in, and she'll figure out a game plan to suit who she's playing. We talk about this a lot, like, players sometimes just have their A game and they don't adjust. She adjusts out there. So, yeah, right. I'm liking that one for sure. And a good doubles player, so, you know, she can come forward, good, you know, good at the net, so she's got an all-around game. Well, this is going to be fascinating, especially as you talk about the doubles, Brett, because... You know, that team, and we can get to the seedings. I'm not entirely sure the rhyme or reason with seeding some of these teams and how it works, but as it stands right now, Coco and Pagula are the one seed in women's doubles. Understandable given their success, even though they haven't played together recently. It's Krychikova and Siniakova back together. Oh, so they're really? back together. Nice. They're back. They're playing <laughs> They're playing together in Czech right now, uh, you know, like a lead-up tournament. But okay. they will be back at the number two seed, defending gold medalists. Seven major titles between them. That's I crazy. Think, between them. And now, and, and now uh, Siniakova with one without her. I thought that was cool. I know you're a Siniakova fan. <laughs> I obviously know that. Uh, she's the best doubles player in the world right now. Yeah. I mean, there's pretty much no denying that. Yeah. I mean, she's great. I mean, it's, it's interesting to have watched her career, like, arc. Because when she came up, she was this next, you know, singles phenom that everyone, this young girl. And, you know, she's had some success, had some big wins. But, like, where she's found her, her lane is in the doubles. And so just winning with Taylor Townsend, shout out Taylor Townsend, TC, TC's finest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was happy to see that. That was fun. That was great. Uh, those are the top two seeds. And we'd say on a collision course, but we know upsets happen. Uh, three seed, Paulini Irani, Team Italy, Danielle Collins and Desiree Kro Kropchak together could be. be uh, Danielle Collins, another one. We didn't see the singles, too. Yeah. And then Canada rounded out the top five with Leila Fernandez and Gabby Dabrowski. So. I think doubles, and, and I said it before, but there's a lot of drama that we see here. Um, I, would, I would love to see the Czechs versus the Americans and some chalk, but any of these upsets could very well happen. And you could, each, you could even get country versus country in some of these matchups. Right. I feel like I like the doubles. I pay more attention to it in the Olympics. I don't know why, but it's cool yeah. to see where it's like, oh, now Sinyakova and Krejcikova are playing because they're playing for the country. And then, you know, how it all shakes out. It's, uh, it's fun. 
There's going to be some entertaining matches, and it's going to start off right away. You know what I mean? It's going to be the action is going to come. It's only a nine day tournament, so you're getting a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, a lot of matches in, so it's going to be it's going to be fun. We're going to hit the ground running. The men's side, just a quick note before we let you go here, Brett Connors on Tennis Channel Inside in. Alcaraz and Nadal are not seated in the top five for doubles. <laughs> Sinner Musetti, top seed. So okay. Italy getting is still being the top seed there. Then you have Bolelli and, and Bavasori, so two Italian teams right off the top. Okay. Followed by Kralitz and Putz, the German team. And then we have two Americans back to back. Fritz and Paul seated ahead of the number five seed, Rajiv Ram and Austin Krychek. So hmm. Uh, Fritz and Paul at the four seed. They're giving them respect to singles players. I feel like just throw all those rankings and seeds out, like whatever. Yeah. Just throw all those names in a hat and then and shake it out. It, it is. It, yeah, Rafa it is and, interesting though, right? Because yeah, like Rafa Alcaraz, like I, I'm looking at them as live dogs or whatever, you know, live on not, not top seeded players. But when I was looking at some of those pairings, I'm thinking they could work, they could blow up. And that's what's fun about this. Right. Like maybe Fritz and Paul work well, maybe Sandra Rossetti work well, or they don't. And it just is a disaster. Right. That's what's exciting. You don't know. Yeah. Some of these teams look really good on paper and then you get out there and maybe they don't, they don't, you know, link up well on the court or, you know, their positives don't link up with the negatives. But I think, man, Nadal and Alcaraz is going to be fun. I hope they make a run just because I want to see more than one match. I want to, let's see some matches of this. You know, and hopefully they both go deep in the tournament and, you know, may, never know. Maybe they play each other in singles or something crazy like that will happen. Yeah, if you're looking at this from a storyline perspective and we're going to, this is a good place to end on. Whatever happens here, you can kind of build to how this is shaping up, right? If Novak Djokovic wins the gold medal, he's done it all. Right. If his career is at, at peace. If Alcaraz wins... He's got this year of destiny. It's just two slams and a medal and still going. <laughs> Sinner wins. He's got one slam, a medal in the world number one. Yeah. You know, or, or an aging veteran shocks us all. <laughs> I, got a, I got a question. If Joker wins the gold, does he ride off into the sunset? I used to think maybe, but the more, again, not in his inner circle, not even close, but I think <laughs> he wants to be the guy that plays as long as possible. I think he wants that like Brady into my 40s legacy. Yeah. Just keep you know, going. Which is like we've talked, I know you and your dad have talked about this, but you, and we've talked about this too with certain players. Like it's not on, the onus isn't on them to go away. Right. The onus is on the competition to force them out. Right. So if he's, if he can keep going, and if he's, another thing is if he's comfortable maybe being a top five player, not one or two, who's to say he can't play into his early to mid 40s? Right. Yeah. That's the thing. Our expectations are so high, but in reality, he's, yeah probably the third he's the third best player in the world at worst you know like the guys who have beaten him lately the joker i mean uh carlos and center but on any given day you can see joker popping up and beating those guys still i feel like so yeah i don't think we're past the time where he's you know still a top guy and can play as as long as he wants to as long as his body you know hangs in there do you think this is where nadal says goodbye uh, I don't know. I thought earlier in the year, I thought for sure, like every podcast we did, I was like, don't think about it at the Olympics, you know, it was like every time. Yeah. But I think after yeah. drawing Zverev at the French, and then I feel like he, that left a weird taste in his mouth. Like he didn't want to go out like that way. I feel like so. And then he's entered, we said the open, we don't know if that's real or not, but you know, and he's supposed to play labor cup. So we know he's at least playing a little more tennis. And I think he might go and play one more time, one more French, I have a feeling. Try and get like a better draw in the first round, maybe win a match or two, and then be able to kind of go out more on his terms. That's what I would think. Yeah, I'm in your camp there too. I think he I think he tries US Open, body willing, Waver Cup. Waver Cup could more than likely will be where it ends, but if not, I could see that path where he just starts clay season next year, doesn't do anything before that. And then tries to have a proper clay goodbye, right? Uh, which would be a little awkward in Madrid because they already gave away the balloons and the cake <laughs> and everything. Right? They rolled their feature <laughs> and their thank you and all that stuff. So that's okay. He'll yeah, do it's it like again. Tom Brady. Yeah, uh, Brett Connors. This has been a blast. I know how busy you are for uh, producing tennis uh, all the way in Stanford, Connecticut. So thanks for fitting me into your schedule, breaking down some of the odds, some of the, the draws, all the action we're about to see. Really, really appreciate you coming on tennis channel inside and i look forward to talking to you on this show again in the future thanks money thanks for having me uh tune in to nbc and peacock watch all the action streaming uh we'll be doing it from first ball to last ball and i uh, look forward to talking to you soon money